Hello, my friends. Thanks for joining me this week here on Origins. My name's Don Chapman. And you know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science, we use it to validate the truth of creation. Dr. Russ Humphreys is here with us today. And Dr. Humphreys is a physicist. He did his undergraduate work at Duke and his PhD is from LSU. You worked from 1979 through 2001 at the Sandia National Laboratories. And since 2001, you've been full time as a creation research scientist. And uh, uh, you're quite a gift to the Church of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for you and for your work. Today, we're getting right to the nubbins of the thing, as they say. We're going to talk about evidence for a young earth. Most dating methods give a, a young world. Uh, and I'm not going to read this whole list, but I, I want to convey the idea that there are hundreds of ways one could use science to get an idea of how old the Earth is. 100, at least, maybe 200 methods. And the surprising thing about this is the proportions. 90% give you a young world. 90. 90. Most. Most of the evidence. Now, you see, other people think that uh, this 10% is all they know about. That's radioisotope dating, carbon-14 dating, light from distant galaxies, and things like that. They've all heard that. That's the evidence that you find cited. But most of the evidence is in the literature, but it isn't tagged. It's in the science literature, but it's not tagged as evidence for a young world. So let's, uh, let's look at some of this. Where are you going to get your evidence, sir? Uh, I'm going to get it from an internet article that I wrote uh, back in June 2005 uh, at the Institute for Creation Research called Evidence for a Young World. And uh, it's got publication and internet references on the back pages. And uh, you find it on icr.org. And I'm going to go through the 14 items of evidence, not all of them, but most of them, uh, that are in here, and you can get more information from that brochure. I'm sure many of our folks will want to go to icr.org and follow yeah. up on that. So I'm going to ask you to go up to our board and to <laughs> present some of those key points of evidence for uh, a young Earth to us, Doctor. The first item in the articles uh, is that galaxies wind themselves up too fast. Now, what's a galaxy? It's an island of stars that's about 100,000 light years across. And a light year is six trillion miles. So it's big. And our own galaxy looks a lot like this one. This is our nearest neighbor galaxy, Andromeda, which is two million light years away from us. And, and there's billions of stars in there. In fact, hundreds of billions of stars. That's exactly right. But you can see that it's not just independent stars, that there is a form to all of yes, that. Yes, you see these spiral yes. structures. They're called spiral arms. They're made up of stars, and each individual star uh, likes to rotate around the galaxy. And uh, around the center of the galaxy, the stars go the very fast. They go very fast there. But way out on the edge, they go slowly, just like the planets in our solar system. And what do you mean when you say they wind up too fast? Well, these spiral arms are made up of individual stars, and the outer ones are going around slowly and the inner ones are going around very fast, so this spiral structure will wind itself up just like a clock spring. And so over a period of billions of years, if there was such a thing, it would, it, it's pulling itself in and becoming tighter. Yes. All the nearby galaxies, including our own, are supposed to be 10 billion years old uh, for the age of our nearby galaxies like this one, Andromeda. But the winding up occurs so fast that even if you had started with a straight bar of stars rotating at the speeds we now observe, uh, it would only take three-tenths of a billion years to wind up to this state. Now, we don't know at what state God started the galaxies, so we don't really know their age, but they can't be much more than this old by just a straightforward be. view. So they hint towards the Earth being much younger than the billions and billions no. we always hear, or to the galaxies being much younger than now, the billions. Now, I should say that the... The other side has uh, a theory. They've had a lot of theories and scrapped a lot, the, but the current one hasn't been scrapped yet, but it's in deep trouble because it doesn't explain detailed structure uh, of galaxies very well. It's, so it's uh, sort of a hand-waving sort of theory right now. It's not in good shape. Now, while you're talking about galaxies, there's something about magnetic fields. Oh, yes. This is recent news that 
distant galaxy magnetic fields are young. See, they once thought that uh, very distant galaxies would be only be partly formed and only partly wound up. And they found out that, uh, that the magnetic fields in those galaxies follow those spiral arms. So this is the letter to nature, strong magnetic fields in normal galaxies, and then I'm going to translate, at great distances. Okay. And they weren't expecting that. So I've drawn in the lines of force in yellow there. See these yellow lines? Uh -huh. Those are if you took a compass needle and worked your way around the, the galaxy with a great deal of patience and a lot of spaceships, uh, <laughs> you, you would find that they follow the spiral arms. And that goes against their theory of how spiral arms might preserve themselves for billions of years. And it goes against their theories um, for this to occur at very great distances. So uh, they're in deep trouble uh, with uh, galaxy magnetic fields and other things. So again, magnetic fields seem to take us to less than three tenths of a billion years. Right. It's and an upper. It's a maximum possible, and it's a lot less than the ten billion years that the Big Bang theory requires. All right. While we're still in outer space, let's talk about comets. Comets crumble too quickly. Now, a comet is what Fred Whipple called a dirty snowball, but this is something that creationists have known about for some time. So I won't spend a lot of time on it. But these dirty snowballs, when they swoop by the sun, lose that material that you see sweeping off away from them, being swept off by particles and light uh, photons from the sun. And that material doesn't all come back. Most of a comet is mostly chunks of ice and dirt. Yeah, and then the, when it gets well close formed. to the sun, it bubbles and hisses and right. emits gas and dust. And that streams out in a tail behind the comet. And, and never comes back. They burn out, don't they? Yeah, so every time around the sun, a comet will lose maybe 5% of its material. So if they come around pretty often, they couldn't have been around very long. They're supposed to be 5 billion years old, the age of our solar system. But it looks like they could only be in the solar system less than 100,000 years at most, 10,000 years on the average. So the other side has a theory. It's called the Oort cloud. Uh, there's supposed to be a cloud of these dirty snowballs way out beyond the, the boundary, and it's a spherical cloud, and that cloud is supposed to feed dirty snowballs into something called the Kuiper Belt. In the Kuiper Belt, we have seen some large asteroid-sized chunks, but not comet-sized chunks of ice, but not very many, and it wouldn't be enough to explain things all by itself. It has to be fed by the Oort cloud. The thing is, nobody's ever seen the Oort cloud of our solar system. In fact, don't we even have uh, uh, evolutionary scientists saying that they can't find an Oort cloud? Yes, I, I knew one back at Louisiana State University who, uh, he wasn't a creationist, uh, but he was very skeptical about the Oort cloud theory. And without an Oort cloud, then comets have to be young. Yes. All right, now we're going to leave outer space and we're going to go down in the ocean. Seafloor mud accumulates too fast. Geoscientists have figured out that we have about 20 billion tons of mud entering the ocean every year. And then uh, we have some that gets out. And the total amount of mud in the ocean, if you took all of this mud and spread it all over the whole ocean, it would be about 400 yards thick. And, uh, and then to get out this mud, it, we have plate tectonic subduction. Uh, that's the only way known to get much out. These plates of gigantic thick slabs of rock are sliding under the continents slowly at about the same speed that your fingernail grows. <laughs> Not very fast. But if it dragged all of this 400 meters of mud underneath, then it would get rid of about 1 billion tons per year. Maybe 2 billion if you wanted to be real optimistic. But that leaves. 18 or 19 billion tons unaccounted for. So we have, let's say, 18 or more billion tons per year, just accumulating year after year. And it wouldn't take too long, from a geoscientist's point of view, to get this amount of mud. So if you measure the mud that was there, how many years would we come up with? Um, at most, 12 million years. Yeah. Now, the thing is, we have this thing called the Genesis Flood to reckon with. And so in one year, you could easily dump 
almost all of that 400 yards of mud uh, in a short time between four and 5,000 years ago. This process of mud entering the ocean is supposed to have been going on for three billion, billion with a B, B years. years, not 12 million. So and if that were true, there would be a whole lot more mud by now. That's exactly right. The oceans would be choked with mud. Almost, uh, yeah, without oceans. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's an incredible argument. And then also while we're in the ocean, not only the mud, but the salt is a problem to the old earth people. That's exactly right. The sea isn't salty enough to suit the taste of an evolutionist. Dr. Steve Austin and I wrote a paper on this. We tabulated, and not only we, but geoscientists in general for 80 years have been tabulating this. There's about 450 million tons per year of sodium going into the ocean. It and isn't really being dumped out of a salt shaker. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's being dumped by those same rivers that dumped mud. Okay. And other sources. There's other ways that sodium can get into the ocean. The mid-ocean, mid-sea springs, for example. Okay. Uh, but uh, getting out of the ocean, geoscientists have only been able to find at most 120 million tons instead of 450. Getting out, like if you smell salt spray at the beach, that's some sodium getting out of the ocean, being blown out as crystals. So that sets a limit on how old the ocean can be also. Now the maximum possible age, if it started with no salt to begin with, and if the rates were the best possible rates that the evolutionists conjecture, then the maximum age would be 62 million years. The Genesis flood could easily account for most of the sodium that's in the ocean today. So. All right. Now, you, you're also talking about the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the Earth's magnetic field is something people don't think about very much, but everyone's had a compass at one time or another. And the Earth's magnetic field is what makes that compass needle point north. And the point of this is that the Earth's magnetic field is losing energy too fast to be very old. Now, what do I mean by energy? Well, the source of the Earth's magnetic field is an electric current that goes around westward in the Earth's metallic molten core. And uh, it's an electric conductor, but the electric conductor has resistance, and that wears down the current year by year. So it's a bit like a flywheel slowly slowing down due to friction. And that current uh, is the source of energy in the Earth's magnetic field, and it's losing that energy much too fast. According to the latest numbers for about the last 30 years, the Earth's magnetic field, all of it, is losing about half of its energy every 1,400 years. In other words, you add up all the parts of the different parts of the Earth's magnetic field, um, every 1,400 years it's losing half its energy. So it couldn't have been losing half its energy for too long. But there's another factor, and that is during the Genesis flood, it lost energy faster than this rate during magnetic reversals. The Earth's magnetic field actually turned itself around from north to south and north to south every couple of days during the Genesis flood, according to the evidence that we have. And the only theory for this, for such rapid reversals, is a creationist one, it's mine, and, uh, and that says that we would lose energy even faster. So you add all these things up and you work yourself back to a, uh, the, the largest electric current that we could have in the Earth's core without having too many problems, and you get a maximum age of about 20,000 years. Again, if you account for this loss during the Genesis flood of energy, uh, then uh, that age could easily be 6,000 years. So we're down to thousands, not billions. Exactly. Again. Now, the evolutionists do have a theory. Uh, it's, again, sort of a hand-waving theory that says uh, that uh, something in the Earth's core would try to maintain this current over billions of years. Uh, so, but again, that theory doesn't work very well. There's not really any evidence for it. No. Now, in support of this young Earth point of view, Mercury's magnetic field looks like it's young. Now, here's a plot of, a, of time along the bottom. This is the year. This is 4000 BC, and here's today. And magnetic moment, that's just a measure of how strong the source of a magnetic field is. And this is a very compressed scale, and you don't need to know the numbers. 
But I have a theory for the created value of the Earth's magnetic field. And then we had, in 1975, the first of these little dots. Um, that was 1975. There was a measurement by a satellite called Mariner 10 of Mercury's magnetic field, and it was already down to here. So my theory would say that the, Earth, that the field decayed steadily on a straight line on this kind of graph, very rapid decay. It's three times fast, faster than the Earth's field is decaying. In another couple of decades after 1975, my theory said, we should be able to detect a decrease of that field. And we found it. Here's the Mariner 1975 number, and then Messenger, the Messenger spacecraft, in 2008 measured a lower magnetic field, very significantly lower. And it's within the bounds of my prediction, or it might even be a little lower. But that's very hard for the other side to explain. That's fascinating. And so both the magnetic field of the Earth and, uh, and of Mercury have indicated that uh, they just can't be that old. Is that right? right? And uh, the same theory works just as well in other parts of the solar system, too. So uh, uh, we think uh, we've got a pretty good explanation of magnetic fields in the solar system, how they started, what happened to them, and how they got to where they are today. And that theory has made predictions. Dr. So Humphreys, the overwhelming preponderance of this evidence piling up one upon the other is so convincing. Each one of them is interesting by themselves, but when you start to add them up, they become very significant. And we have more evidence that you'll want to hear. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The bird feather. It couldn't just happen. For their weight, feathers are stronger than any man-made structures. The design and functions of a feather are even more astounding. Evolutionists claim that reptile scales evolved into feathers. Feathers have a much more complex DNA structure than reptile scales. There is virtually no similarity between the two, nor is there any fossil evidence showing the transition from scale to feather. So how can evolutionists claim this really happened? We are back with Dr. Russ Humphreys, and we are talking about evidence for a young Earth. Dr. Humphreys, you've given us some amazing evidence, both from science and from the sea and from the magnetic field of the Earth and of Mercury, but you have some other evidence you want to show us as well. Yeah, this is more fun evidence, more uh, things that people can grab hold of right away, and that, that is that biological material decays too fast. This has been happening the last 10 years. These are only samples, but mitochondrial Eve was supposed to be 200,000 years old, but as they actually started at mutation rates to figure out how, how long ago this mother of all living things was, they got as low as 6,000 years, and that was actually published. 6,000 so, years. So mitochondrial Eve is pretty young. DNA in amber. DNA, that's a model of a DNA yes, sir. molecule right there. DNA is supposed to ch uh, decay within 10,000 years. Uh, the experts on DNA say even if you preserve it in the best possible conditions, it will fall apart on its own within 10,000 years or less. And yet, in amber that's supposed to be 135 million years old, they can reconstruct the DNA of insects. Interesting, lots of things. So that's less than 10,000. Permian bacteria, Permian era was supposed to be 250 million years ago and yet they have revived bacteria from uh, formations that are supposed to be that old. Again, the DNA, their own DNA should have fallen apart by that or be, been destroyed by environmental radiation. And Neanderthals, they've d dated Neanderthals. By the way, they're ordinary humans, just another branch of the human race, uh, and they got some blood uh, that was allegedly 40,000 years, and they reconstructed large parts of his DNA. And so, Neanderthals were probably here a lot less. Less than 10,000. Less than 10,000. Dino blood cells. Uh, they found at, uh, blood cells from a T-Rex a few years ago. You may have read about that. I it's did. supposed to be 70 million years old, actually less than 10,000, probably. I so, think that's amazing evidence. Yeah. This is real simple. Uh, not enough Stone Age graves. Now, the evolutionary point of view, this is time along the bottom here. Mm -hmm. And this is the evolutionary view of the total population of the human race. 
about a million people it would be limited at by hunting and gathering. You just can't get more than so much food per acre by hunting and gathering. And then uh, at the end of that period uh, of limited food, then suddenly some bright cave guy uh, is supposed to have discovered farming. I don't know why it would take him nearly 200,000 years, but anyhow, then the population took off. But if you ask yourself how, ma how many people were alive during that 200,000 years and were buried, you get about 8 billion people. That's 2 billion more than are on the earth now. So you should be able to go to your backyard and find a Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon grave, and you can't. Uh, I haven't found any. So it's more, much more consistent with a short stone age after Babel, which was after the flood, uh, for a few hundred years in most places. So only thousands of those graves exist. And it's consistent with a short time, not a long. Now, this is one that's obvious. Written history is too short. If you just plot the number of published documents that we can find, uh, now the published documents are in the billions. Around the time of Christ, the number that uh, were around uh, couldn't be more than millions. And uh, back around the time of Abraham, we're down to thousands, like the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And somewhere we get back to Noah's diary, and that period of time is small. It's only 5,000 years. And so, uh, you know, what about the other 200,000 years? What were we doing then? We were supposed to be pretty when, smart. When they say that, that before that time, man couldn't write? Yes, but that's kind of hard to imagine because uh, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon men actually seem to have been smarter than us oh my. to survive in, a, in an ice age. Uh, we, most of us would probably not survive, so they were smarter than us. And so, they used cave paintings and right. inscribed on uh, bone, uh, the phases of the moon. Why not use the same skills to write history? So when you add all this up, where, where, do, you, where do you think it brings us, Dr. Humphreys? Well, it brings us to a young world, uh, and it brings us to uh, the evidence for a young world being greatly outweighing the evidence uh, for an old world. So the data for youth heavily outweighs the data for age. And uh, the radioisotopes in the age of the Earth, I haven't talked about that. I will next time. Uh, talks about nuclear dating ages and actually uh, uh, deals with diamonds and takes carbon-14 right off the old side of the scale and makes it a friend of young Earth creationism. And uh, the other old data just drop right off the scale. So can you trust your Bible? Yes, I think you can. Don't just look at any one of these, but look at the concluding pile, the preponderance of evidence, and it becomes irrefutable when you add it. You are um, a uh, PhD in, in physics from LSU, and then you worked in New Mexico. Tell us about your work at the Sandia National Laboratories. Well, that's a sister laboratory to Los Alamos, the more famous one. Uh, both of us work on atomic and nuclear weapons. and. Uh, Sandia is about 7,000 scientists and engineers, more, more engineers and scientists, and uh, they're more engineering-oriented, project-oriented. But uh, it was a great experience for me. I learned more physics there than I thought I could possibly learn, and I learned a lot of, about the geoscientists, too. My first project there was to drop a, a probe down into an empty oil well hole, a borehole, and uh, developed this probe to find out what elements were down there. In the process, I learned a lot about oil uh, drilling and other kinds of geoscience. And you had a successful career there from 1979 to 2001. And then during the latter part of the time you were there, you were working part-time as a, in, in creation science research, and then in, since 2001, full-time in creation science research. Yes. Uh, I'd say, actually, I started creation science research before I came to Sandia, even. Oh, wow. But I was doing it in my off hours and my weekends. As we begin to, to look at uh, your, your presentation today, uh, how do we put together scientific evidence and scripture? How do you deal with those issues? I was an evolutionist, and uh, most people grow up thinking that all creationists were born that way, and they grew up in Christian families, but I didn't. You and, didn't grow up in a Christian family. But uh, I think it's instructive for people to know how a scientist is trained and where he gets some of his ideas about evolution. 
versus creation. So it was the evidence of science as well as the Word of God? Yes, uh, science evidence was important. Also the, the Bible was. Well, what is the actual evidence? All these years I've been told that the earth is old, but nobody except for one, maybe one textbook had one sentence that might have given me one shred of evidence. Uh, nobody has really to borne down on the evidence. What is the actual evidence? And I had the strong feeling that I was on to something then, uh, that I was on the right track. And uh, I found out that there's very little evidence for billions of years, and that there's a whole lot of evidence for thousands of years. A few years ago, back in the late 80s, um, Dr. Steve Austin, a creationist geologist, and I were doing a paper on salt going into and out of the ocean, sodium going into and out of the ocean. And I, uh, I wanted to check out this with a local geochemist who worked for Sandia National Labs, just as I did. And, uh, and geochemistry is the study of chemical elements in the ocean, such as sodium. And I wanted to find out if he knew of any way for large amounts of sodium to get out of the ocean, or at least had some guesses. And uh, it turned out he didn't know, and that uh, on the basis of that alone, the ocean would be much younger than billions of years. I, I had said, well, you know, uh, it doesn't look like enough sodium is getting out of the ocean. It looks like the ocean has to be very young. And he says, no, there must be a way that enough sodium is getting out of the ocean. We just haven't discovered it yet in 80 years. But we know that the ocean is three billion years old, so there must be a way. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> Tell me more about that. How do we know? And he started to cite a little bit of other evidence. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, I have a lot of data on, on those subjects. There were other subjects besides geochemistry. And uh, would you like to take a quick look at some of that? And he said, no. He said, I won't look at your data until people I trust say it's OK. So I said, who is it you're trusting? And it turned out to be Stephen Jay Gould, who isn't a geochemist. He was a paleontologist right. who was a foremost uh, advocate of evolutionary paleontology. But I was amazed that this young man, he was still in his uh, mid-30s, didn't see the illogic of his own position. He was trusting Stephen Jay Gould not to be doing the same thing in his own field that this young man was doing in his field, geochemistry. That's amazing. Now, we've been taking evidence. You say there's, a, there's somewhere between 100 and 200 different ways that we can look at things that would measure in some way the age of the uh, universe and the age of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, you took 14 of those key ones in an article that you wrote some time ago. Will you remind us of that article? Oh, sure. Let me show you a picture of it. This is an internet article, and it documents 14 items of this young world evidence. And I did it for the Institute for Creation Research in June 2005. And uh, you can find it on icr.org, and it gives you references. Now, on, on a previous show, we listed, I believe, nine of the 14 evidences that you have in that article. That's just a sample. That's yeah. the good, some incredible samples. And I urge the people to remember the preponderance of the pile of the evidence, not just the individuals. But yeah. one of the things that, at the end of the show, you said that it was like 90-10, that you believe 90% of the evidence hinted towards a, a, a uh, young earth, but there was 10% of the evidence that maybe hinted at an old earth. But today you want to speak to those issues that were in that 10% category. That's exactly right. Uh, and uh, I'm excited for you to do that, especially this first one that talks about carbon-14. Right. Everybody tells me you can take carbon-14 and you can date the earth and you can find out it's billions of years yeah. old. Yeah. What do you say to those folks? Well, I say carbon-14 has now turned around and we use it to show the world is not billions of years old, but only thousands. It's become the friend of creationists, so. We'll be anxious to see your evidence for that because there's a few skeptics out there right now when I just heard you say that. So please share. Uh, well, you've is... worked in this area pretty extensively. Yes, uh, on the radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth project, I was a co-author with Dr. John Baumgardner and several other people uh, on carbon-14. And so uh, one of the shocking things that most people don't know, and they don't know why it's shocking yet, but is that all fossils have young carbon-14 ages. Now, if you don't know why that's a shocker, uh, I need to explain. 
Uh, this is from standard radiocarbon journals. And things like coal, wood, shell, bone, marble, natural gas, CO2. Um, this is from standard journals that deal with carbon-14. And they all found carbon-14 in them. So they're radioactive. Now, carbon-14 decays pretty fast. It's got a half-life of only 5,700 years, you know, a little less than 6,000 years. So after a million years of decay, there would be no carbon-14 atoms left in any fossil. Yet all these fossils are supposed to be older than 2 million years, and a lot of them hundreds of millions of years old. So it was a trade secret of the radiocarbon community. Uh, for many years that uh, this was happening. But it turns out that uh, it really supports a young world. The conventional age is millions of years. The standard carbon-14 age of all of these is less than 70,000 years. And the average is about 50,000 years. But when you correct the assumption that goes into carbon-14 for what the Genesis flood did to the situation, then the age drops to about 5,000 years. That's, so, that's amazing. Yeah, carbon-14 is now the friend of creationists. That's amazing. Now, diamonds play a part in uh, bringing this all to the head, head as well, don't they? Yes, that's right. Uh, it has to do with the excuse that people use. All the labs assume that somehow modern carbon was getting into the fossils, and that has a lot of radio for carbon-14 in it. Uh, so we tested that assumption with the diamonds, like you're mentioning. So, in other words, uh, the, the explanation they would give for the carbon that was there is that somehow a new carbon was getting yeah, into like, the old like fossils. Like, say, fungus got into the coal somehow. And but you found the hardest carried. thing you could find where there couldn't be contamination. Right. Diamonds. And what did the diamonds teach us? They have young carbon-14 ages, too. Nobody had ever measured diamonds. Wow. Uh, because uh, you can't contaminate them internally, so they wouldn't, wouldn't expect any carbon-14 to get in from the outside. And uh, the labs don't contaminate them externally. They've taken great precautions not to do that. And uh, we use the world's best carbon-14 lab. And its specialty was small amounts of carbon. And they had 20 years of experience. And these things are from the depths of the Earth, which are supposed to be billions of years old. So the conventional age for these diamonds was between one and two billion years, hmm. dated by other methods, other radioactive methods. But the carbon-14 gives you an average of 58,000 years. That's the standard. And we think the assumptions on that are wrong. If they're corrected, uh, we think that uh, uh, less it's probably 10, less than 10,000 years. 10, years. Now, uh, the other side came up with a thought that underground neutrons are somehow generating carbon-14 in the diamonds. And that was a good theory. Uh, but the problem is the measured amounts of underground neutrons are too low. And so uh, helium leakage from radioactive zircons deflates the billions of years. This is the next item on item 10. At a well in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, Researchers there recovered some microscopic crystals of zircon. That's zirconium silicate. It's in almost every granite there is. And uh, all of these contain uranium. When zircon forms, it grabs uranium from the surrounding lava. And, uh, and it rejects lead. So it's an ideal lab for radioisotope studies or you know, radioactivity studies. So we noticed something about the helium that uranium decay makes. It makes helium as well as lead. You've heard of alpha decay? Yes, sir. Yeah, alpha particles are helium nuclei. So when a uranium atom decays, it spits out an alpha particle, and that stops somewhere and grabs two electrons and becomes a full-fledged helium atom. And in the size zircons we were looking at, a lot of them would stop. The alpha particles would stop inside the zircon. So I'm going to show you how many helium atoms a uranium atom makes as it decays down to lead. So we'll count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we know how much lead was in, 
uh, is in a crystal now. We know that that crystal from experiment, we know that zircons don't like lead, so they will reject it when they're forming. So if you know how many lead atoms are in the crystal, then you know how many helium atoms were deposited. And that's important. Now, another thing you can do is date this from looking at the lead and looking at how much uranium is left and taking today's decay rate, and you will get a date that way. And you get one and a half billion years, which is consistent with evolutionary ideas about the formation it's from. So now that helium leaks. It's known that helium wiggles through a crystal and out into other uh, surroundings leaks into the mica that surrounds it. Mica is that flaky, shiny stuff in granite into the mica, which is called biotite. So the helium leaks out. And usually it leaks pretty fast. So it was surprising to find so much helium still left. Now the question is, how much is left? So here's the depth in miles, half a mile down to two and a half miles. And the temperature gets hotter and hotter, up to 277 degrees centigrade. That's hotter than your oven gets. And here's the percentage of the helium that we know was deposited that's still in those crystals. 80% in the top, and then it diminishes down to a tenth percent at the bottom. 58%, 42%. That's a lot of the helium that's left. And this surprised everybody who heard about these results the first time it happened. So we duplicated those results. But uh, this time, we wanted to find out how long it would take for the helium to leak out. So now I'm going to do a graph. Now, I know a lot of the audience is afraid of graphs. <laughs> are you afraid of graphs? No, oh, okay. I've never been bitten by a graph. Okay, it's a good attitude. Graphs are our friends. So, but I'll show you, set up the graph. We're going to plot leak rate versus temperature. So along the bottom here is temperature. And I'll just... Uh, show which way temperature goes. It gets hotter moving this way, and the color gives you a clue. And then the leak rate is vertical, faster and faster as you go up, and this is a tremendously compressed graph, a factor of a trillion from sure. top to bottom. We used the data about how much helium was left okay. to, dis to make some predictions about how fast the helium would be leaking when we measured it. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, we made predictions based on either 6,000 years here or one and a half billion years. And of course, the one and a half billion years would have much lower leakage rates because uh, it has to stay in the zircon much longer. So uh, now I want to show you the data. I want you to see this because this is, uh, it, it's very surprising. I don't know of any other way to convey the surprise than to show the graph. Okay, here, here are the percentages. Um, 42, 27, those percentages in the table I showed you before. And th that tells us how much helium was lost, and if it was lost in 6,000 years, you would have these diffusion leak rates. Technical name is diffusion, the real name is leak. And if it was slower in one and a half billion years, then the leak rates would be much lower. So. There's a factor of 100,000 difference between these numbers and these numbers. And we predicted this in print in a book that was published in 2000 AD before we had any measurements made. And then we got some measurements made. We commissioned heat helium leak rate experiments. This is the borehole, uh, what comes out of the borehole. It's about this big around. Ground up the rock, extracted the zircons, put it in the, we didn't put it in the experimenter we got uh, put it in, and he was an evolutionist, and we went through an inter intermediary, so he didn't know he was doing creationist work. And uh, we can compare our, the measured rates that he got with the predicted rates that we made. So here's the prediction again, and here are the data. Wow. And they fell right on that. Perfect on the line. Yeah. So anybody who's a techie says, wow. <laughs> and that's what I said when I first saw it. In fact, I didn't believe it at first. I thought I'd made some mistake. Uh, but uh, so it really resoundingly verifies the 6,000 year prediction. That's and amazing. It really rejects the uh, one and a half. So this is the data, the blue dots, 
lining up with the red, and uh, it just completely rejects the other model. I've never seen in my scientific life anything it, that badly rejected or that it, It's that such a perfect accepted. line, it's amazing. Yeah, the leak rates are so high that the zircons have to be very young. So we took the measured losses and, in effect, the math is more complicated, divided by the measured leak rates, and we got a date for it. And it's 6,000 years, give or take 2,000. Plus or minus, yeah. And that's, um, that's just amazing to me uh, that, that we would get this. But yet, the same zircon gives you a one and a half billion years when you use the conventional uranium to lead dating. So that says that God must have speeded up radioactive decay during that period. And a lot of other lines of evidence from the radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth group uh, show the same thing. In incredible research and uh, very valuable research. Uh, folks, it's just amazing that as more and more research is done, as science really digs into this, that even the evidence we thought pointed towards an older Earth is beginning to line up on the side of a young Earth. Dr. Humphreys is doing some amazing work. He's going to share with us when we come back uh, how you can look a little more deeply into the work that's being done. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Mount St. Helens, a new geologic story. There is extensive evidence that the layers of strata in the geologic record have been laid down very quickly, similar to the processes observed since Mount St. Helens erupted. The major formations of the Earth's crust are sedimentary rock beds formed by rapid erosion, transportation, and deposition by water. Rapid global formation of sedimentary rock beds is evidence that the Earth is thousands, not millions of years old. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Russell Humphreys, is a physicist and speaker with Creation Ministries International. Russ did scientific research for 22 years at Sandia National Laboratories and has published some 20 papers in secular scientific journals. He is the author of Starlight in Time, where he proposes a model for a young universe. Book orders are being taken at 800-616-1264. Russ has also been involved with the Rate Project, which has produced breakthroughs on the subject of radiometric dating. Dr. Humphreys can be reached at Creation Ministries International, P.O. Box 350, Atlanta, Georgia 30127. Or visit the website, www.creation.com. We're back with Dr. Russ Humphreys, and he's been talking to us about evidence that used to seem to point towards an old Earth is now pointing towards a young Earth, carbon-14 and helium leakage, some amazing research that you were able to do with the RATE team. Tell us a little bit more about the RATE team, will you, Dr. Humphreys? Well, it's uh, radioisotopes and the age of the Earth, and on this very program, you had the leader of the project, Dr. Larry Vardaman. He was an excellent scientific project leader, and another m member of the team, uh, Andrew Snelling, and we had six other men on the team, including myself. And all creation scientists, but all with a different area of expertise. That's right. But there's a technical book that documents all of our results. Uh, it's uh, technical. I should emphasize technical a lot. So for people who really have a background in science and really want to say, is this evidence valid and really look into what you're studying, I think the carbon-14 is probably pushing some buttons from some people who want to say, how That's can exactly they be right. saying that? And there is a book that gives all the scientific validation of your work. And it's an excellently done book. It uh, really is. Dr. Snelling was one of the editors, and uh, we uh, had a, a bunch of different expertises brought together on it. It's really worth it if you're a technical person. Now, for the other people in the audience who are not techies, there's a layman's book, Thousands Not Billions. And this was written by Dr. Don DeYoung, who is also on the team. He's a physicist, but he's also a very good popular science writer. And uh, that's available on creation.com and other creationist websites. And this would be understandable to the layman who has an interest, but perhaps not as deep a background in the material. Right. Don will go through all the background. So. And you can get that with a DVD as well, which I yes, think is really a, exciting. Yes, a DVD that has the same name and several others. Now, here's a non-technical book that has many details also, uh, the Creation Answers book, and it has chapters on cosmology, too, if you're worried about how the light from distant stars got here, carbon-14, and plate tectonics. That's another subject that hasn't been touched. 
So it really is beginning to be quite a volume of material for people who seriously and objectively want to look at the evidence. There's more and more evidence there to look at, isn't there, my friend? Yes, I, uh, I think we have every reason to be happy about this. So the young world makes sense out of science. And like I was saying, uh, the evidence for a young world vastly outweighs the evidence for an old world. But things have happened so that the rate data explains these nuclear dating ages, carbon-14 uh, and diamonds. Carbon-14 has changed sides. And the rest of the old Earth evidence is coming off the scale. So we want you to know about this because we want you to trust the Bible. Because if you can't believe that verse, you really can't believe John 3.16 either, can you? That's right. Yeah. Dr. Humphreys, you've done a great service for us. I want to thank you for your service. Oh. Forty years you've been uh, helping to accumulate valid and objective uh, scientific research that helps us to see the truth of God's Word and that, in fact, we have a young earth. And uh, all of the church and all, uh, really should be grateful for the incredible work that men and men like you have done. So on our behalf, we want to thank you, and we want to thank you for being here today with us on Origins. And friends, we're so glad you've joined us on Origins as well. I hope that we've made you think today, and I hope we made you want to dig deeper into the scientific evidence. But most of all, I hope that we've helped you to believe that you can trust your Bible with all your heart, and you can trust the God that the Bible reveals, the God who loved us so much, he became a man in Jesus Christ to die for our sins, that we could have the precious gift of eternal life. Beyond, above all of that, I want you to remember this today, my friend, that it's God's view that he created you. That should be your worldview, too. So I hope you'll join us soon again here in Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend.